I want lawmakers and lawyers to question what law is. Why are we creating it that way? Why are we creating these rules? And why particularly these kind of rules? And are they are these rules reflecting our values? And which values are we living up to? Dr. Abir Haddad is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine, sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Dr. Abir Haddad is director of the Institute for Legal Transformation, Capital 40 Under 40, alumni of the Max Planck Society for the Advancement of Science, and teaches modern law of Arab States at the Institute for Private International Law at the University of Cologne, where she received her doctorate summa cum laude. Congratulations, wonderful. Previously to that, she developed transformative legal adaptations to address future challenges posed by climate change and exponential technologies at Resilience Frontiers Initiative, a forward-thinking project of the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat, where she still is an advisor. And that's kind of how we know each other. A couple other different ways. We're both uh, with Resilience Frontiers as well. As director of the Institute for Legal Transformation, she is now applying her seven steps to legal transformation methodology to other areas of futures and disruptive uh, change, exploring the law of the future with a thematic focus on anticipatory legal adaptations that promote sustainable living in balance with nature and foresightful regulation of exponential technologies for a prosperous society. Together with other lawyers, Dr. Haddad founded the Network of Multicultural Lawyers, which provides a platform for German lawyers with a family history of immigration. In her academic career, Dr. Haddad has been selected as one of the 20 scholars worldwide for the Falling Walls Foundation Female Science Track 2022 and won the wild card for the Women in Leadership Program. Also, she is a founding faculty member of the European Club for Leaders and Sustainable Innovation Program. And I could go on for days because she has done absolutely everything. Welcome, Abir. I'm going to call you Abir because we're actually friends. And um, even though you have all the accolades and titles and have been doing this for a little bit. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Mark. You're most welcome. I'm so glad that it finally so worked much. out. What, what you just said. It sounded so much what you just said. I don't, and like, it doesn't feel like this. It just sounds impressive, but. I, I believe it's because you take a uh, very systemic approach to what you do and, and in order to do the things you want to do and address those forward futuristic uh, ambitions, it's, uh, there's quite a, quite a bit of facets involved that you, that you have to address, study, learn, and be aware of and know what's going on because it's not just this, uh, siloed approach to, to life anymore. You just can't be just a, a, a lawyer specialized in one area. It's kind of a, a, a much bigger picture than that. Um, that brings me right off the bat to my, to my first question. So in some respects, I believe you're um, a global citizen, but you've had some um, interesting experience, experiences of how you've gotten to this point in your life. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing some of those with us. How did you end up in Germany and studying law in Germany? And, and uh, you kind of uh, get into this, this direction, into this field. And if you would mind uh, sharing that with us, that would be great to, to find out a little bit more on this journey. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you talk about me being a citizen or like a citizen of a national state, then it started all in Iraq. Iraq, of course, like where I was born um, in Baghdad, like in the capital. 
Um, so I grew up there and uh, after like, you know, Iraq had some wars and then embargo. And after a while, uh, my dad decided to leave the country because of political uh, issues he had. My father's family side were like more drawn to the communist side and it became quite dangerous for him. So we needed to leave. So I left with my dad to um, uh, to Europe, like as a, yeah, we like re as refugees, like you, you, you seek refuge somewhere else. We had a quite good life, like a uh, um, good middle class. We had a big house and a pool and everything we needed, but it become, became quite dangerous for my father's life. So that's why uh, he decided we needed to leave. And um, that's what we did. Um, and so I had many stations like as a child in uh, several countries in the Middle East and Europe. And then somehow um, I found my way to Austria and then to Germany, where then my dad was um, because we were separated on the way. So I was separated from my dad as a young kid, as a young girl. Um, yeah, was kind of a um, you would call it uh, unaccompanied underage refugee. So this was, I think this is a very important point why I am the person I am today. Uh, and I am, and I like became a fighter in every sense. Um, so yeah, this is I think where it started. And now I have also the German citizenship additionally to that, but I wouldn't call myself German or I wouldn't call myself Iraqi. Or whatever I like my heart is a part of my heart is in Japan in a place I love part of my heart is in Jordan and, and in other places in the world and I wouldn't would really call myself a world citizen this is at least how I feel that's beautiful so I mean that that's kind of what I wanted to bring out because I, I people ask me a lot how how did I get involved with what I'm doing and and uh how did that journey come about? And I always have to tell them, you know, I wasn't uh, struck by uh, lightning. I didn't see the climate God. I haven't been a refugee or in uh, some kind of a conflict. It was a gradual transition over time. And oh, sometimes I almost feel like people are a little bit sad that that uh, that I didn't have some catastrophic experience to to lead me to to move more in environmentalism and activism, climate, and and uh, in the UN direction uh, that I am. But this this experience that you had uh, at a young age um, kind of helped you understand some of the the problems in in governance and countries and nations and 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 living elsewhere and moving some of what maybe is, is going on in, in the UN. You started this firm just not too long ago. Um, <clears throat> and what do you do with your law firm and or your firm? And, and exactly how are you trying to help people with this? And tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I would love it. Can I go? back to what you just please do that i um, like with my journey i understood no back then when it all happened i didn't understand anything i was just angry about what the un did what the um majority of countries how they treat us in iraq and how they started the war and why like i felt treated very unfairly um so it, i just became angry and then i decided when i when i'm older I will be. I will bring myself into into the position to change that. I will bring me fair, more fairness to people and change people's lives. And um, I decided back then that I will need laws for that. Like it was quite clear that I will be a law changer for me back then. But I didn't understand how exactly and where are the problems i just understood that the un resolutions back then were were not really thought through so um um this developed then and the how developed then uh, by time and this is exactly what i do right now so i'm fulfilling kind of the vision what i had back then when i was um, um like experiencing war or uh, fleeing or like um, being illegal somewhere 
and not going to school because I was illegal somewhere. So, um, yeah, and this is what we exactly do right now in, uh, in the Institute for Legal Transformation, me and my team, a really very diverse team. Uh, we support um, different um, 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 shareholders, which is like companies and um, public um, organizations. So in companies, we support um, the mindset shift towards the values we need for um, for the transformation we need to uh, yeah we, to create the future we want right and um, therefore we support and consult in companies like like some major big German companies or international companies here and for uh, um, like public organizations we do um, um, try to in, um, uh, provide also um, research by Re yeah, researched and um, mm, courses uh, on again this mindset shift towards um, the like the law we need. So and what we do also for lawyers for law firms is and this is like very near to my heart is I try to influence as much lawyers as possible to think out of the box to think about law differently and therefore we have um, for example a course which called like workshop on legal transformation and, and, and so on, where we, um, uh, yeah, where we try with legal arguments, with the history and the past of law and the legal philosophy to create slowly a kind of a mindset shift or a thinking out of the box for lawyers so they can be the, um, the advocate for the legal change. I think that's very telling and i want to ask you some questions around um this almost i mean it's i think you were on the border of refugee or do you are you feel comfortable saying at one point you were a refugee so to say i were definitely okay. i were but i am not anymore um yeah. but in my head maybe still uh i think this is nothing you can just like skip away and forget about like these these experiences, of course, um, form your character forever and makes you empathic and makes you think differently like anyone else around you, of course, because you experienced the other side, right? You experienced um, things other people around you, especially if you look at me in which environment I am at right now as a lawyer, quite successful, 40 under 40, teaching at the university. So the people around me are people really mm, uh, kind of like successful or wealthy or whatever. So um, <laughs> having these experiences, even if you don't talk about it, um, it just makes you unique in the way you think. Just because of that, even if you don't want, like even if you don't do exercises like I do, like futuristic exercises or, 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 or read a lot, just like having these experiences makes you think differently and want different things and question everything quite differently. Uh, this started back then in my law school that I questioned everything. Like, why is it that way? Why not different? Why? Because, because the majority says it, it is because, but I experienced other, other realities. So why is your reality the right one? And uh, I have another reality. So that's why I question always what's around me. And yeah, that goes back to different experiences, of course. I love that because normally the, there's a statistic that comes out every year through the United Nations for refugees. And usually once you become a refugee, it's... Uh, very hard to, to get out of that situation you they say that it's high, um something that uh you're can be locked into and it's getting better day by day but um there there's some people who you know um it takes 25 years to get out of that system once you're in in it and it's so ingrained um and unless you find the right refuge and the right support and uh, to do that there's all sorts of uh, facets to that you know whether you have a, 
uh, um, a passport, if you were able to leave with your documentation, if you had education before that, if you didn't have education, all sorts of factors that play into that and um, that make that process pretty pretty difficult. And it sounds like in the beginning you you moved around quite a bit, but I how, how, you know, and I'm glad you answered this. I, I had a strong feeling that you uh, are really good at calling bullshit, so to say, by seeing all sides, you know, uh, even though you're in a room with, you know, white male lawyers uh, or whatever, and, and they have no idea what it's like to be a refugee or to be a woman or to be from another country, um, that you can kind of really tell them how it is and how it feels and what kind of a rights you wanted as a citizen. And so I'm, I'm glad you you brought that up. And I, 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 I truly believe that is also what we need in this world at this point in time. So we talk a lot about these, these acronyms and buzzwords, SDGs, ESG, and on and on. Um, and environmental social governance, ESG, governance is a big, big factor. And we're realizing more and more that our uh, judicial system, our governance systems, our policies, our laws um, are so varied and different and also sorely lacking in, in different places of the world that I, I've heard and seen you work on some very forward thinking, forward moving ideas and concepts and kind of pushing the future of, of the policies and the laws, the governance that we need. One example that's interesting is your Dubai Judicial Institute. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about that, but then I want to dive even deeper into to maybe something that's even more controversial. So, um, Muslim laws and religious laws and, and governance and kind of also women's rights and, and things that are going around the world that you're kind of working on, you're thinking ahead towards the future, how we can shape those policies so that they'll be ready for that re renewable, sustainable, environmentally friendly future that we need to, to get to, that we're working towards with the UN. So please start, if you don't mind, first with the Dubai Judicial Institute. Oh yeah, there was so much right now. So let me take it step by step. Yeah, like back then when I was like um, doing a lot of research for Resilience Frontiers, we tried to find out what's the uh, most effective tool or what's the most effective way to bring the change we need. And in my field, of course, in the legal field, I was like researching all um, that. And for me, it was after a lot of like reading and researching and 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 um, analyzing what brings the most or faster change we need, I uh, analyzed that the judges or judges or courtrooms are those where the most change can happen rapidly and can lead then to influence the law or the legal structure in a country. It depends on how the country structure is or if we have a state of law or, uh, or not. But in general, we can say that. So for me, I was I decided back then, okay, I need to take influence on courtrooms and I need to um, bring, make it possible that courtrooms can be more innovative. They, they can be a driver of change and climate change laws. Because, okay, not climate change laws, because laws are made by the governments, but at least court, climate change cases would then could be put into um, into laws. And so luckily, I am lucky that I can consult and um, uh, support a Dubai, um, a Dubai Judicial Institute in that like I am a lecturer there since um, last year. And now we are develop we developed a whole concept for them on how to get the, 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 the judges to think ahead to to bring the mindset shift not only towards uh, climate change, but also towards um, exponential technologies, because I think both do not go without each other. Like these are, for me, the most disruptive um, um, factors we need to tackle. Um, and so this is what we do. And we, we um, try to, to bring Dubai to be the first and most innovative courts 
um, education, let's your legal uh, um, judicial education, so they can be a driver of change. So I think I mean I'm, I'm really really happy that I what I envisioned and what I thought. Oh my gosh, this would be a good tool that I can do right now for living. This is quite exciting and amazing because this is the concrete and this is what um, this is like to put in action what I researched back then and I just take action step by step to create um, to use the law to create the future maybe me and other few people like you envision <laughs> which is which is uh, yeah selfish <laughs> so but yeah th that's fine the selfish part of it is totally fine and I mean it's I can feel your and sense your passion and and you know, you describe it as happy that you can do this type of work. What is what is the the flip side to that? Is there a, a certain amount of impact in people that you're influencing certain things that you can see that really shift or change the world and, and, and that 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 these things are needed to move us on the right side of history? What what are you seeing on the ground where you're saying, boy, that's something that really needs to be shifted or that we're working towards to 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 push that for the betterment of humanity to move forward? Um, yeah, I mean, I can see clearly a shift in the discussion. For me, it's important the legal the, the, the discussion in the legal field. This is the field I want to impact the most. Uh, because like I have the education, the tools, the knowledge, the study where I can, as you said before, like when I'm in the room with people who do not have the same experience, I am, I I I have the ability or the legitimation to to discuss and because I have the education, I have the summa cum laude, like you know, and I and I do teach uh, law, so. Um, this constant work towards like having this uh, profile makes me, um, mm, yeah, makes me able to start a discussion. And this is exactly what I do on social media, for example, on in universities, in, in conferences. And it, I can see a clear um, a discussion starting within lawyers, within uh, universities, and I try to influence students as much as possible. So a lot of students, meanwhile, reach out to me who say um, that they don't get the, um, enough education on climate change, on climate change law, on not the tools, how to create innovative forward going, um, uh, forward thinking, uh, legal concepts and that's why they reach out to me so we're working also there's also something we're working on with the certain university in Germany to create like a longer uh, curriculum for students um, uh, for law students to bring them this concept of uh, innovative um, transformative law um, and, and, and teach them tools how can they use um, Again, this is my method, um, comparative law, which is like a very, let's say solid legal tool. And then of um, foresight of futures uh, methodology to, um, to, yeah, to, to create some, yeah, to, to question and to, to be change makers in their field. And when we influence the, the the student well not influence like when we teach the students as much as possible they will be able to to drive the change forward because the youth are the Fridays for future right and even lawyers even law students which we really forget and or universities forget it's like like lawyers do not have anything with the like societies um changed or societies movements outside so um no this is something we actually work on and where I also think that will this will have even a more more impact because universities need to listen to their students so yeah these are other, let's say small steps I can't because law is very slow like it's so slow um, nothing goes very fast and for me I want a systematic change like I don't want to just create one or two projects and that's fine I want a change in in that and in, in people's head, you know, I want 
people to question. I don't want, I want lawmakers and lawyers to question what law is. Why are we creating it that way? Why are we creating these rules? And why particularly these kind of rules? And are they, are these rules reflecting our values? And which values are we living up to? And maybe question those values again and again. And uh, I'm happy to support <laughs> whatever, um, like to, to introduce new values we definitely need and not only just proclaim. So I can, so, uh, can before see- Before we go on to the yeah. Islam, uh, I, wanna, I wanted to just mention something there that I think you're all already gonna jump on. But basically we're seeing more and more people suing the government, suing uh, yeah. countries. Um, because of environmental and climate actions. So one, uh, one big one is Yuliana versus the United States. There's a, uh, another one where Greta Thunberg's on it. Um, there's some in Norway and Denmark. And, and uh, even Germany had one. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how the youth were involved in that, but they um, was showing that the climate environmental law, there's some, some things were messed up. Um, in, in, in a lot of respects, uh, I I also studied law, and uh, um, so it's it, it's it, it's very uh, as I said, we're protecting laws that are bad. We're kind of protecting outdated, uh, what I call bad laws, um, instead of trying to find a way to make to improve them or to make the laws better so that they're equal for everyone, so that it's kind of future proof, so that it's thinking about the the future. Um, is is this something that you're you're not only seeing more of, but you're also involved in kind of these youth movements or these other movements for environmental climate things, or or directing people to the right places to look? Hey, I feel like my future is being cheated. You know, is that one way to change the law? Is that uh, what we need to do? What is your feelings and thoughts and involvement in that aspect? I I don't think I'm an activist. Like I don't also like act, act, activists or other people who are doing it better than I would. I rather focus on like the um, I um, the how, how how should I say if you in in the legal field nothing works like other other fields, and if you want to create a change there okay, like there is a movement and it's fine and the government needs to react to that. But the problem is lawmakers and lawyers and, for, and most of all researchers at the universities and professors do not know how. And this is where I, uh, I want to contribute or I do contribute. This how, if you want, how to create the laws we want, the proactive laws, the laws which are future orient oriented and according to the values we need. So that's why I try more to focus on the research part, on the argumentation, on creating this mindset shift as a discipline, like it is a discipline taught in universities. Um, I need to focus on one thing and because nobody does it. And Again, I have the education and I have the nerdiness. Let's say I'm a really, really nerd when it comes to comparative law and I do love research. So I have all the, let's say, um, attributes to do this really, really hard work. Because again, all everything else, everyone is better than me, I know. But in this part, I'm so good. I know I can, I, I can create change, but really based like on, um, um, let's say basic, not a basic level, but 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 I think which would lead on the long term, which would really lead to a major change. And yeah, for that, um, again, I'm just involved with students um, uh, movements, like how um, to 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 support them um, and teach them how to um, think differently and how to perceive uh, um, 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 other legal systems with comparative law and teach them about what you just 
said, for example, and again, exponential technologies, what's coming towards us. And therefore, I also um, I um, create this um, methodology where, where, which can be really followed step by step. Uh, and I try to teach as, as much as possible. So, yeah, my field would be more the legal discipline is, uh, itself than like going on, like, of course I do on, uh, I go on the street and marches and everything, but I, I wouldn't say that this is my biggest impact. My biggest impact is like creating a discipline, creating a, a discussion. And so in every, and I hope, and this is the future I see, that in every, uh, when every law will be created, let they take into account, how can we make it more proactive, future oriented, and take into account this and this and that. For example, why do we think, um, uh, how, how do I say, uh, we think very problem oriented, like we have the status quo because uh, like, okay, law is perceived very reactive, which it is like the law we do have right now is just reactive. If you, you studied it, this is the way we learned how law is, is this is the way our brain is wired like I remember when uh, Dr. Yusuf Nasif, um, my boss, um, when he told me, Abir, we we work on creating a future, and you, a lawyer, start coming up with future concepts for law. And I was like, this is not possible. No, like it goes against everything I learned, everything I ever studied, and I would like I can't call myself a lawyer if I do so. Like it was like everything inside of me was just like resisting this request. Um, but then I remember, I mean, it was a challenge. So I went to bed and, and like, I uh, yeah, went home, slept. And two o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I was like, wait a minute, why not? So I grabbed a piece of paper and started writing whatever ideas came to my head. And then the next morning I run to him and said, okay, it did click in my head. Why not? I am programmed just this way. And that's why I refused what you said. But it doesn't mean I'm right only because I studied this. And this kind of change I want to bring everywhere. Okay. But let's say I needed to convince myself first. And I know how hard it was. I mean, okay, for me, it didn't take long because I'm innovative. I was innovative since ever. But for others, it will take much longer. So I, I, I want to bring this change. So so people start like all lawyers can be then the change makers like I, like I am now, which would be amazing. I absolutely love that. And so we're going to get sidetracked one more time and it's not a bad sidetrack. Um, I understand it. Uh, hopefully a lot of my listeners understand as well, but you've mentioned foresight, futurism, the future many times. And just in that last section, as well as, as well from the beginning, What's the future have to do with it? What, 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 why, why are you so innovative? Why are you talking about the future? What does that have to do with law? I thought you just, you know, you're just, you're just watching over the laws and, and kind of reactionary. What's the future have to do with it? Exactly. Very good question. Because law is just watching over society, let's say, and keep society and everyone trying to keep everyone safe, let's say, okay? Or like law is a reflection of the values we do have. And it's just sort of a manifestation of the rules, how we want to interact with each other as society, right? So the rules we agree upon will be like written into laws. And then we create enforcement tools, which are police, military, taxation, whatever, to force people to live upon these laws. Again, the rules, which are the values, right? That this is how it goes. So, and the way laws were made is we wait till something in society changes. Change. Uh, new problems are created, like new contracts, new, I don't know, homosexual people want to marry, for example. Okay, we need to deal with that. And then we start, every, after like five years or 10 years of like people struggling, you know, uh, then we start, to, uh, uh, they go to court, Okay, and then again, that's why I think that courts are so crucial in this movement, because the first thing, um, the first place will be like getting in touch with 
new societal change will be the courts, not the law. Okay, <clears throat> so courts will decide one, two, three times, blah, blah, blah. So we'll have a, um, a judicial law, let's say we call it. Okay, Richterrecht. So, and then, um, and then, uh, and then, like governments think about changing the law. Okay, so it's always reactive on societal change, which is already happening. Okay, so people decide something, they do it, and law needs to decide. So I have a completely different approach, again, completely the opposite to what you studied and what I studied and what I am very much like resisting or was resisting law as a tool at creating like a creative, let's say, uh, legal system or legal framework, which can shape society rather than, than just reacting. And how do we do with this? Because in thinking forward and using foresight method, I know it sounds quite quite crazy, and every for every lawyer it sounds very very crazy what I'm saying, but it sounds just crazy till you do it and it works. Then it, <laughs> you know, and and again, um, if you think of law as just reflection of the values we do have. Mm -hmm, but the problem is it's mostly not reflection of the values we do proclaim, you know, because we pro proclaim we want equality for everyone, human rights for everyone, uh, gender equality, blah, blah, blah. But our laws are definitely, like I sh can show you hundreds of laws, are definitely not implementing these values. So we proclaim completely different values than the ones which are reflected in our laws. So you can see it very clearly in our taxation law. So wealthy people are taxed less than people who are like middle class. There's ways to go around it, you know? So um, how to create laws which are according to the values we proclaim, okay? I don't want everyone to live, live, live on um, upon like the values I want or like it's just like the ones we even the ones we proclaim we should um, uh, have legal implementation of those so how are we going to do this again because we know where the world is going we okay we don't know no one can tell you where, where the future is going of course but there are certain um, there are certain research showing us like ICC, ICC, IPCC report, for example, or many, many, um, many research on exponential technologies where AI is going, or blockchain is going, did it? So um, to, to, to start dealing with those uh, disruptive um, changes and, um, and creating, again, that's why the mindset is so important to be able to react very fast um, uh, when you see something is, is, is changing in a certain way, not only reacting when, when it's too late, and this is what we do. And in so many ways, it's just way too late, like laws at least five years behind, at least. And if you think of climate change and exponential technologies as an exponential change, we're lost. Like we lost if you want and I think governments, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting outrageous as you see. <laughs> and like governments and national states, if they wanna keep on existing, they need to look and react much, much faster because what's the point of having a national state? Like, I don't wanna have a national state. The only thing we, we say, okay, it's fine because it's protecting us. And to be fair, it's protecting me and you living in a wealthy country from others, right? Which are living not in like in not wealthy countries. Okay, we don't want to start with climate injustice right now, okay? Or the injustice in the world. But again, it's just like protecting, let's say, just protecting the or um uh um the citizens or providing a, a certain kind of lifestyle for the citizens and whatever you want to say, okay? Uh, but for these, you need implementation tools, 
right? So I feel like these implementation tools are losing impact more and more with exponential technologies. So the societal creation and change is getting out of hand from national states and governments towards big corporates uh, with all the technologies people are using. So what's the point of having a national state if you think 10 years ahead? I gave all my rights on my privacy, my information, everything. So how gonna the government say, uh, protect me? Even, okay, the government are, is even using those technologies to also <laughs> collect the information about me. But this is another, <laughs> another topic, okay? But you, you see my point? Like, I'm not talking about this much needed change in the legal thinking or I'm, I'm really concerned on the long term really concerned. It's not the status quo, which is, um, which, I, which I'm afraid of. And it's, it's really, if I look 10, year, 10, 10, um, 10 years ahead, um, for me, it's more dystopian than utopian. That's why it gives me the motivation to create the utopia. That's beautiful. Um, I, I, totally with you and, and just kind of to clarify and maybe even go a little bit deeper our, our world is growing exponentially around us good bad ugly however you want to say it and um, probably the fastest way for human evolution is through social cultural evolution um, that's the fa fastest way we can we can grow now when we're talking sustainable development that most people don't understand development has been around forever. We've de developed residential, commercial um, cities, uh, countries. That's just business as usual form of development. When you tack on the sustainable, it's means to sustain and keep that in progress with our exponentially growing world to sustain humanity, culture, and those things along the way. And so if we just look around at, at development, uh, most areas we live in, the infrastructure isn't developed up to speed to the world that we live in. There's the homes aren't passive, the water, the waterways, the, the, the farmland, the, the energy infrastructure, the, the, the water infrastructure. It's, it's not keeping up with the climate change, the environmental problems and the, whether it's population growth or or uh, the way a city should do on on the the aspect that you you're discussing as well as the society humanity is evolving it's growing um, we're changing we, we, you know uh, same sex marriages uh, r religious law laws and beliefs things that have been around for a long time that don't make sense anymore. A lot of these things that legal or governance infrastructure is outdated. I tease a lot, but I say still in the dark ages or in the industrial revolution, it's still uh, not um, progressive towards the times. And it's also holding humanity back for that fastest form of, of, of human evolution, which is cultural and social evolution to get us to the future that, that we're striving for. And as long as it holds us back, that means that infrastructure, that thought system, it makes it difficult to advance and progress to a new epoch out of the Anthropocene. And so that when I hear you speak, when I hear you talk about that, when I hear you talk about the future, I'm saying, nail, you've nailed the, 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 you've hit the nail on, on the head. And I think you're, you're right onto something. I, I would like you to go even more, if you don't mind, kind of how you how you feel um, the future is important. Why you've you know why you got in there? Start. I mean, I, I you you talk about the future. You talk about frontier technologies, blockchain, you know, uh, um, and and many other pioneering technologies to to move us forward. How does that help you? Why is it important? Or do you think that's part of the shift to, to for us to use to get 
humanity on the right side of history or out of the Anthropocene? Wow, <laughs> really good, really good questions. Um, like, why is the future important? Mm, I don't know. Like, I can't tell you hundreds of answers, but in the end, there is no future. It's just like the moment we're living in, like there's no yesterday, there's no tomorrow, right? I think anyway, we have a false concept of time. So there is no future. It's just like the current moment is endless and we age and others are coming, younger generations and nature is evolving, like having the cycle of winter, summer, whatever. So it's just like, I think we humans have the false um, conception of time and future and past. It's just like a very long present moment we live, we live through and then we leave this present moment, right? That's why it's so important to do change or to believe in the power of the present moment. And I think this is what keeps me alive, that every, every change in the present moment, no matter how small it is, it can affect my present moment, which will come, right? And it can affect moments of other people and younger people. And again, this has to do with, if you go back when I was a, when I was a child, I felt unfairly treated. I felt that no one cared about me and my future and how I live. No one cared that I was lost. No one cared that every, the, my world is unfair to me and I was treated unequal by law like by law. So again, I swore to myself, I'm gonna change that. So that's why the future, let's say if we call, we'll call it, we use this word, but it's again, it's a false concept, but I need to use these words. The future of the generation, which is now 10, 15, 20. I don't want, like I don't want it, I want to do my part so they don't feel unfairly treated, which they are, which they do. Because why? Because Mother Earth or our planet or environment, it's not given to us by our parents. So we don't own it. It's just bored, borrowed from them. And this is not from me. I read it somewhere. So it's just something we need to keep alive or prosper for them. Again, because I have the empathy of knowing how it is to feel unfairly treated by those who are in power. So I get to my, myself a point, to a point where I can say, okay, I have some power. I have some influential power. I'm getting interviewed by you, for example, and I can, people hear my voice. So I want to use this voice to be an advocate for those who are not in power yet, right? Does it make sense? <laughs> it it does. I, I'm I'm not sure if I totally agree with you because I I still want to know because you haven't answered fully. Ah, okay. If it's the present, why are you so interested about future tools, future uh, systems, future technologies? Um, because I know you have an interest in that. I know uh, there's a there's a reason that ties back to the, the legal things that you do or you're trying to promote because you're you've also been asked to to help push or progress the future of governance the future of of legals for example with resilient frontiers and other things so how do those two things tie together why is that even though it, it, you know we're we're living in the now and in the present why have is a certain amount of your interest or your knowledge been been focused on the future? How does that tie together? That's what I'm uh, asking you. I'm, maybe I, I like what I said. Maybe I didn't say it clearly. It's not I'm not interested in the future. It's just like the future is just a form of the present moment. That's why what I do in the present moment will influence the future present moment. Let's say so. Um, it's because again. I don't, I, I'm good in many things, 
but being a lawyer uh, and dealing with the current laws is something other people can do better than me. What I have as a huge asset is this empathy and this creativity mm, not many lawyers do have. <laughs> and, and the passion for research. And so um, these, this, <laughs> so this makes me quite unique. I was always very, very unique during my studies, during my research. I was, uh, I was always a challenge for my uh, supervisors during my PhD um, time and my research time. So I was always challenging everything around me. So when I came across then foresight and futures literacy, I was like blown away. I was like, oh my God, there's a tool on how to put all this into like to channel it, to create something good. And um, so everything then made sense. Like, as you said um, at the very beginning that you need to be, um, you know, to, to have a lot of interest to, 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 to be able to create a change and not being only a lawyer. I was always many, many me's, like not all, only one thing. I was always different pers personalities and different interests. And now, like Steve Jobs said, like connecting the dots, everything suddenly makes sense. Even my research, my comparative law, my Islamic um, Islamic finance, uh, Sharia uh, uh, expertise in Sharia law, like all this suddenly, oh, and my different, like speaking different languages, it suddenly makes sense. And I feel like, okay, I can channel it in a way that I can create um, or offer tools for ev for everyone who want to make change in the legal field um to to set now again to use the present moment to set the the ground for the better future because the future is coming anyway like the future moment is coming anyway right so we need to use the present moment right now to create little change or maybe major change i would hope hope to to direct to change the direction of the present, uh, of the future present moment, which will come towards us, you know? So it can look different than the one which will come if I do not do anything. And if I just work in a law firm, you know, I had job offers, it was mind blowing, like get really leading positions in German ministries with very, very, very safe contracts. And I was like about to sign. I think, no, like I can't do this, of course. And I would do a great job and I'll, of course, even um, in research and like trade law, I would I would be great, but I would wouldn't use my present moment to create the fastest and more effective change for the future moments for others. You know, so does it make sense now? <laughs> Absolutely, it makes okay. sense, and and now that's also nicely trans transitions into. What you also touched upon is uh, you, you speak many languages and you also have this uh, great knowledge of Islamic law. And I want to know, uh, we've talked about this before um, offline, just between us, that um, I worked on the livability thesis for NEOM, the city, city skill uh, that's coming up and, and many other projects there as well. Governance and law is a big, big factor um, for any city, for any, for, for any place of the world, but especially for um, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and different areas of the world for us to understand um, those things. How, how does that tie in and what are your thoughts or feelings for progressing um, not not just finance, but law in general, uh, uh, Islamic law in general. How does that work? What does it look like? What are your progressive thoughts in that area? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I can tell you, like, before my life as a legal futurist, oh, I call myself right now being a legal futurist, before I was really, like, one of the, yeah, let's say, well-recognized researchers um, on Islamic law, Islamic finance um, here in Germany and Arabic law, what I do teach. So I'm quite, um, in Germany, quite 
ex I have quite expertise in that. So what I meanwhile use a lot in my uh, in my futuristic research also because Islamic law influenced me a lot because it is not a riddle written and um, um, codified law. Okay, so the Islamic law is. And I'm talking about civil law and contract law. Okay, I'm not talking about um, uh, family law or whatever. Like this is my field of expertise. Um, it is what it taught me because I really dig deep, very, uh, very dig deep, very much into it, and did a lot of research studies in Islamic countries and with Islamic scholars. Um, what it taught me is because it is not written, it has not clear words like we do have with our German law and, and the way I think as a German lawyer is completely challenged by Islamic law because it's based on certain rules which are based on certain values. Again, you know, so you need always to go back to the values of this law to check if it can be or can't be, which makes on the, like on the other side a little bit difficult because every country, every scholar, can come to a different um, outcome. Like we see, we see in Saudi Arabia, it's completely different. Islamic law, like we have it in Lebanon, for example, or in Syria or in, uh, in Egypt, like Egypt and Syria, it's quite uh, similar. But the outcome can be very different because the law is not written, not codified, like we have it in national states and yeah, in many national states, especially in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia is, the only country in Islam, Islamic country who do not have um, a codified civil law, for example. That's why you can have very, very different outcomes when it comes to, for example, family law and contract law. But the trade law there is, is quite um, sorted out meanwhile. So what are my thoughts on that? I think that if you just really, again, go back to the values of this particular legal system or the thoughts of Islamic law, which are amazing because like every like every religion started of with good thoughts and good intentions, right? Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, everything you can you, you would agree on every on the core values, right? If you go back there, you can also with other tools, you can create, still create um still create laws let's say again you can't create the same meaning of laws we do have in european eurocentric um uh, picture um you can create a quite um, good laws let's say for living with each other and neom oh my gosh neom is such an amazing project for me because it's like the absolutely playground like it's ground Oh, you can't use the word ground zero, right? <laughs> ground zero, yeah. But, but, but Naom is like, there's, there's, oh, oh my gosh, this is the only place on earth where you can reinvent everything. And this is the only place on earth where you can reinvent law because you can reinvent technology or you can uh, crush down a building and, and build it again, right? But law is, is built upon so long tradition and societal um, influence and 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 um, yeah tradition. Let's say you can't just change it very quickly. That's why I'm I'm saying it will take me a long time to create this discipline. But Naom is just a mix of everything. Technology is coming together with humanity. Homo sapiens is like facing. Uh, homo units as well, like the, the 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 robots with ai oh my gosh it's gonna be amazing and i'm sure we need rules for that for example how do we want to interact with ai do we, we are a legal subject in our um in our uh in our legal system we humans are legal subjects do we want to give um legal personality to these AIs, which are like interacting with us and maybe um, are aware of their existence or not. We do not know, like Lambda, you, you know this, this interview with this Google AI, uh, which proclaims to be aware of its existence. So 
I'm, 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 I'm doing a research paper on that for the Max Planck Society on like um, legal personality and, and, and for AI, which is quite interesting. Um, on the other hand, how do we want to treat nature in this, um, in this concept? Because again, Neon can create a completely new understanding of what is a legal subject, what is a legal object, what is to be used, you know, because we treat nature right now as a object, according to at least in our German law, according to um, um, our civil law, uh, we 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 say that um, um, animals are not kind uh, of What is Sachen? They're not things. Okay, they're not things, but we treat them like things, so we can yeah. use them have ownership uh, uh, upon them but how is it yeah why is it that way so why don't we use for example um uh values or leap or, or um, um understanding of indigenous people where the where they do not treat animals like things what they can own but um living beings like them you know with with certain rights even like we do like to put to take away the human from the center of our legal system again i'm a proclaimer of rethinking human centered law okay so i'm a big advocate of rethinking the human centered legal framework where, where everything is just centered around the human so again back to neom this is where you can create a completely new framework a system a way of thinking that is not around only the human but also the nature and human is just part of these three and what i say is um we need to rethink of how we govern what created us which is the nature nature we the humans and what we created, which is then AI. Okay, we can change AI in many things, but AI is getting very, very close to human intelligence or above. You know what I mean? So not only what we, what created us, but also what we created, and how can we create an ecosystem with with those um, uh, or a legal system which gives rights and obligations to one another. And I'm working on that, and I think it's amazing. <laughs> so okay. I, 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 have, I have to tease you a little bit, but in, uh, um, and, and you're not the only one to do this. A lot of people say, 90 minutes, what are we going to talk about of that? That's so long. You know, we haven't even got halfway through all my questions, and we're already uh, probably close to 60 minutes. So... Uh, I'm just, I'm so glad to, to get your oh, passion wow, and, and you're relaxed uh, about it. Um, now I'm, I'm going to get into the hardest question I have for you today. Um, and it's, it's a big question and I can frame it in two different ways. I want to know for you, what does a world that works for everyone look like to you? Or you could frame it in another way. Um, what's the futures? Um, but I, but I, I think the the best way is really what does a world that works for everyone look like for you, Abir? See, I caught my brain thinking of removing what is right now. But this is not the right way of thinking about the future, right? Um, I was tending to say, oh, no boundaries, no borders. But this mean I'm just thinking of fixing the status quo and not creating a future, right? So. <laughs> um, Keep going. You're on a roll. <laughs> so the, the, the right future or the future I want for everyone it's also, again, I feel always very, um, very e egoistic when I make myself, when I think I'm create, I'm on the road or on the path of creating something, which I think it's right, but you never know if you're right or not. 
you can have the best intentions, but it can be wrong or it can be going wrong. So at least from my point of view, um, creating the future I want um, or the futures I want where, where I think it would work for everyone is uh, when every person on this earth is perceiving nature and the planet as a part of us and we are just part of it. Like again, removing us from the center. We're just intent, intel, very intelligent animals. Removing ourselves from the center and um, let us be part of the whole ecosystem. And I'm not against exponential technology. I'm not against creating things which can be used in a good way for us. Not at all. But even with creating these technologies, I want, again, moving away from the present moment in the future is that we managed, we managed to find a way that while creating these exponential technologies, always taking into account nature, prosperity for everyone, and to use it in the best way, not only for humanity, but for the planet, again, animals our energy, uh, like, okay, like, and I would, I would love it. I would love the future where energy is monetary, mon monetary, how do you say, like, it's a sort of money. You know what I mean? So I would be so rich. I would be one of the richest people on earth. If good energy would be like an asset, holy crap, I would be so rich. So that's, that's why. Amazing. <laughs> yeah and i think it's good you know i think it's getting now very crazy i know i'm not talking like a lawyer but if you want me to talk about really about the future then it is a future where energy real energy good energy you can just feel it you can sense it among people where it is an asset it is a can be monetized and i can give you good energy heal you whatever in exchange for something you do for me you know, and we move away from this money financial system, which is just like, yeah, kind, kind of dis detaching us from being human. Yeah. And if I think also about the future, I don't, I think we will be aware of other uh, beings around us. And if we are in like back into being human, we would be able to sense them probably, right? And also realize that our planet is not the only planet. It's just like the only planet we can live on right now. Except Elon Musk managed to get us on Mars, which is not an alternative for me, but okay, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, and just being like every person in human being more humble, and removing us from this center and this power where we, which we use really to destroy everything around us because we are so greedy. <laughs> I love that. So, um, especially that you, uh, you know, we're we're um, not at the center. We're not at the top. Uh, we we are another animal another species I, I love that you said that and i i truly um am in full alignment with you and what i hear when, when you said that is that we become more part of uh, a symbiotic earth us more aware of all other species and other things that take us out of this this model where man is at the top or that we're in our ego of things uh i hear that a lot and i, I want uh and i don't i don't know if you know i'm sure you do um but there's been more than 21 different civilization models in our world before early antiquity mesopotamia incas aztecs mayans greeks romans on and on and uh all but three of those collapsed because of ecological or environmental collapse. Basically food and infrastructure, basic needs and resources, the structure 
couldn't hold the weight and um, the societies collapse. Those civilization frameworks collapse. Those societal frameworks, those cultural frameworks um, collapsed. And the three that didn't collapse because of environmental or um, ecological collapse, which, which really I have to say one more thing, is all tied to infrastructure, food, resources, the basics of life, um, collapse because of disease, conflict, or displacement. So there was some kind of a disease, there was some kind of a conflict, or some kind of a displacement that caused those people to leave. But all of them, all, all of the collapsed civilizations we've had in our world, and it's only a few thousand years back, they all collapsed because they were running the exact same model for that civilization framework. And that model is a form of governance. That, that, that model is a form of, of, of laws, of ways of ruling society. It's a form of governance. And that model is a hierarchy model. And that hierarchy model was usually with man, lord, emperor, king, somebody at the top, peasants, slaves, and laborers, farmers at the bottom layers holding up this, this society. It's very, uh, it's very hierarchy. It's very class divided. It's very much um, this ego. It's very much uh, a, a really, really um, negative model for civilization, for society, for culture. And it always reaches a limit to growth. Maybe technology, maybe uh, um, that can extend the collapse. But that's why I believe that what you're doing, that what you're working on, your answer for the question, what does a world that works for everyone look like, is really in line to getting us out of this hierarchy model into more uh, Maybe a heart-shaped model, you know, that we're kind of seva, that we're man and woman are equal and, and together with all other species on our planet acting in symb symbiosis. We're currently in the Anthropocene, and I truly believe that in order to get out of the Anthropocene, we need to have a new terminology. We need to have a new governance. We, you know, when we talk about the Anthropocene, it's, you know... It, uh, human-made uh, climate change and man-made destruction uh, of, of our planet or influence on, uh, on our planet. Whereas if we move to what you've been saying this entire discussion into the symbiocene, into a symbi symbiotic relationship with our planet, with Gaia, with, with our earth, with mother nature, um, I believe that it is a model that is keeping up to speed with our exponentially growing world, is keeping up to speed with culture, religion, with, with uh, uh, this global citizenship. And it's also this different narrative. It's a narrative of collaboration and cooperation one with another on this planet. It's thinking multiple generations, how we can sustain and, and and uh, hold ourselves. And so everything that we've discussed, everything that you said and questions you've answered so far have kind of really, that's what I keep pulling out of, 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 of what you've been saying. Um, in your governance work, in your reforming the judicial and the education system and teaching that shift in, in and, law, and the, the lawyers of the future and the governance of the future. And, and it, you know, if it, I, hope, I hope we can get your advice and your help with NEOM and other projects around the world where it's kind of this green field for the future of governance. You're already doing that for Resilience Frontiers, really helping as one of the advisors to, to kind of push that envelope. And, and Yusuf, Dr. Yusuf Nassif, a, friend of both of ours and um i think is really helping to, to push that forward as well how, how how do you feel that um we can maintain that that uh 
that progress, that momentum, so that we can advert a collapse as well. How? What do we need to do? What do we need to continue to do to kind of work down that road and path? Uh, is there a form of reaching a critical mass at some point, or is it just um, keep persisting to moving forward? Are there some certain ideas or things that you've learned over the years that you can advise us on to kind of help us all change that thinking of, of, of the models that we use in life and, and governance? Okay, again, Mark, your questions are like, hide a lot of a lot of mini questions within it so again i i think 90 minutes are not enough <laughs> i would love to go back to the governance part which you talked about at the very big uh, like the, the be very beginning of your question and then going to the second part uh which is what we do we need to do uh, and resilience frontiers um governance and the cultures which are col uh, which collapsed and the hi 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 hierarchical, hierarchical, you see hierarchy me? model, yeah. <laughs> um, it's um, that's why for me, I do spend a lot of time in the desert. I do spend a lot of time as much as I can, which I will go next week again, um, with Bedouins, which are the only indigenous people I understand the language. So. Again, coming from research and comparative law, we think that it's most important to use first-hand resources. Like analyzing second-hand resources doesn't bring you anywhere to understand the law really well and the values and the data. So that's why you need first-hand resources. That's why you need to understand the language at first-hand. So the only indigenous people I understand their language first-hand is the Bedouins. And I can do um, even the accent because my father uh, was taking me as a kid to to those places so I can even the culture the, uh, the, the accent I can imitate so I can talk to them and they uh, and I go into the desert in Jordan and they um, the eldest of one of the tribes took me under his wings we would say and adopted me like kind of part of the family that's why I, I can go there and learn learn as much as I can so I go I'm just to 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 tell you a short story was um, I met him like this elder got uh, a piece upon his soul he died lately um, uh, we met when because he came to Friday's prayer to the village and this is where where I met him because I told someone I want to meet one of your elderlies I want to ask questions and he said our elderlies they don't come to the village they they stay in the in the desert. So it was Friday and he was like, yeah, lucky you, he's coming to the village for the Friday's prayer so you can meet him. So I was talking to him and I was like, you know, and he said, you know, people, we had like 10 goats and five uh, sheep, and we were happy and people now have like 70, 80, whatever, and they're like stressed out. And I was like, you know what? I'm collecting a lot of, you know, awards and a lot of education and a lot of like, you know, um, uh, titles and it doesn't really make me happy and smile like you do and he was like yeah I know what you need you need to come with me and um, um, as a shepherd you know take care of goats and I was like holy yes of course I will so we did I came the next day four o'clock in the morning his son drove me to him into the desert like 40 minutes or 15 minutes and I just supported him like was like his assistance for the goats and the cheeps and like how and and he was telling me for hours how they move how what they do how they, they communicate he was telling me for hours about the flowers about the every everything which was growing there why it is growing the wind how to read how to read you know steps of animals which animal why is it going this direction not that direction Oh, and so I kept going there and whenever I can to learn from those people to be in touch with nature, to be connected to nature, to, to see how they think also about animals. If you see how heartbroken they are, if they know a mother goat lost her baby 
And all the village, like even strong men, they look kind of like this, like are really taking their cars and their horses and looking for the mother goat because they felt so heartbroken. And he's like, and one of them, uh, his name is Ali. We were looking for the mother goat and he was like, imagine, uh, I don't want to know how heartbroken she is, the, this mother, this mother animal. Um, um, imagine you lose your baby. It would be, it would be so, it would, it must be so sad. So they left their work and go looking for the mother goat. What I want to say is this deep connection with everything around me, with animals, with the mountains, with everything living around me. This is um, something I needed to learn from those people. And I do keep on learning and I try to force myself to become, to not lose touch to nature like I do here when I'm here. That's why I sleep always outside in our garden and it was like raining all night, it was beautiful. And you walk, wake up and birds around you and um, small animals around you. So I, I got used to it. I very much got used to it, to, to live within nature and to be just part of it. So, oh, I was talking about governance. I'm sorry. So Bedouins, they have a decentralized governance system, right? So because they live decentralized, they, every family, um, they're nomads. So they live um, in tents and they move around. So there's no one structure, one city, one street, and everyone knows this is my this is my um, property. They don't have property. They don't have the understanding of property, like land ownership. Earth belongs to everyone. Like you can't own it. It's not possible. You know this their legal concept. Even they would call it legal concept. But how can you own a piece of land if it's like mother earth and it's it's for everyone and it's just like treated well treated well so the next generations can use it and this is also something i learned from them when we go on hunting like i don't do not hunt but i go with them just to learn and it's like the way that they think how they hunt when they hunt what to hunt it's always of okay i just take an amount which i need right now to survive so I will leave um, something for future generations. And even if I don't know the future generation, it can be from another tribe. It doesn't matter. And like this way of thinking like just freaks me out. <laughs> and I think it's so important to learn like this way of thinking because it's also humans, but they have completely different concept, like, like our monetary concept we do have. And this decentralized way of living, I think we can learn a lot of. So what I did is I tried to find out, and I'm not done yet, um, with a decentralized way of living of Bedouins and how we can, again, going back to exponential technologies, how we can implement that on DAOs, on decentralized autonomous organizations based on a blockchain. So DAOs are basically decentralized systems, right? Governance systems. So why do we... Again, why do we, and this is like a kind of a Eurocentric way of thinking, oh, we need to invent this with our technology and da da Why don't we go back to humans who manage to do it well, living decentralized with each other? Why don't we learn from them? So I want to mix this exponential technology with this indigenous knowledge. And I think then something great can come out of it. So this was about uh, governance, I'm sorry. <laughs> So now we're the that, front, right? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, what was it? Um, what do we need to do right now? <sighs> um, like in Resilience Frontiers, we say that we need blue swans, right? We need some kind of um, a major, something happening. Uh, we do not know what to bring a major shift which we do not know what exactly right now it can be, because if we would do, then it wouldn't be a blue swan, right? Like the black swans we just had with Corona, it shifted so many things. We wouldn't think it would be able before. And 
that's why we need to create this kind of, and there are even green swans right and green ducklings you had oh i forgot his name there's he was ugly ducklings there's green <laughs> swans blue swans gray swans there's white swans there's black swans yeah, yeah it's all from um uh, a, a couple people so the green swans comes from john elkington um but the, oh, and the ugly ducklings even yeah yes yeah yeah and so we need so what it is exactly i can't tell you because again if i would i think it would be um unmasked i don't know i i don't think i know so much and everything that i can tell you what exactly it is I just can tell you in my field, I'm working on creating this blue swan with what I do with my institute. This is my blue swan. That's and beautiful. since I do not, I can't control what I don't know. So I'm just working what I do know. This is my blue swan. So, uh, and Yusuf, uh, Dr. Nas uh, Yusuf Nasif is just like my major, major inspiration. Like he's such an inspiration for me and he influences my thoughts so much. And I'm in constant exchange with him and like to always check how I'm thinking and the way I'm thinking that it's going in the right direction. And I think he's like, for me, he's like the, <laughs> the futurist, um, uh, even if he doesn't call himself futurist. That's great. Yeah, he's a great man. He's been on the podcast as well. And I, I love working with him and seeing him as much as possible. Are you a global citizen and how would you feel about the removal of all borders walls and limitations between humanity one and another what's your view or understanding about this and then how do you think we can achieve the symbiocene that i've kind of been talking about that you've been talking about in a different way okay these are two different questions again mark you're talking to a lawyer so my brain is quite do, 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 do. <laughs> we're so, gonna get you out of that <laughs> oh no i need this structure i need this structure so you know it's just like so i get things um accessible to lawyers so i need this way of thinking which is fine i'm, I'm, I'm doing well so in, the, in this combination the, the first part of the question was if i'm a global citizen i think i am and again, the word global citizen is also a concept of us. So within this concept, I think I am. I wish I wouldn't say that because I'm just a human. Or even I'm a form of an animal. With a well, kind of don't you think the Bedouin story that you just gave, that that person is a global citizen, even though it's very local, but he's basically saying, I don't own this earth. I can take my sheep and my goats anywhere on this earth and share that. I can nurture nature. I can care wh where I'm at, but it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to everybody. Yeah, and but it, I, it, I'm, it, I'm, yeah, I'm, go ahead. But the word citizen, Mark, citizen is a concept. It's a, like a fiction we do have of citizen, which means, again, sorry, I'm thinking with my little brain. Citizen, you are. You have a passport to work with a certain nationality, right? It's something legal. It's not just a being, you know? It's a paper which design, uh, uh, defines your citizenship. And that's what, like, what I'm arguing. It's like, I don't want to be a citizen of anything. I just want to be a human, like, and living on this earth and not defining myself by being a citizen or not, or being what kind of citizen, even a better citizen, which is a I love that. You know what I mean? It's That's like, what, yeah, well, I, I mean, can, another another form could be a, a crew member of Spaceship Earth. Yes, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I'm fine with that. Definitely, definitely. And again, for Bedouins, no borders exist, no citizenship. They are, like, they have the citizenship of the country they live in. Okay, let it be Saudi Arabia. Many friends of mine are from Saudi Arabia or Jordan or Egypt, whatever. whatever. But they it's just like it just de detached from their identity it's just like okay this is a paper i need to have but i am part of this earth and these borders do not exist for me so when we went hunting 
We crossed national borders. It's just like, oh, we're on a hunt. This is Earth. This is our space where we live. And it's it, it's not like, oh, there's a you you could see, you could see the national guards everywhere, but for us it didn't exist. And this experience for me was so mind-blowing because if I may tell you, when I was a kid, I also crossed national borders illegally, right? As a refugee, you cross borders illegally. So I did the other experience as an adult, but it felt completely different. It felt so natural because the, per the people who were with me, they didn't believe in these borders, you know? But when I was a child with a, uh, with a smuggler, her name Schlepper, Schlepper, I don't know how to say it. Um, smuggler, yeah. Smuggler. These borders existed and they made me so panic and afraid. But and they didn't. give you anxiety, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but they existed only in my head and your head and the head of everyone. But they do not really exist. So being with the Bedouins, I experience that these borders do not exist. You experience more of that symbiosis, the actual breaking down of borders, because they don't even they don't even think about it in that way. We have a mutual friend, um, Hindu Ibrahim Omaru. Oh my gosh, I love she, she. She's wonderful, but she, I mean, she's from Chad, so uh, I think what do they call it? Pastoral community uh, is is her, but in, in Chad, um, they have they take their cattle thousands of miles across many borders across mm -hmm. many borders to graze um because that that's the lifestyle of that pastoral but they are from chad but they also believe strongly in the land and that it's not owned by anyone and that they travel and um that more and more around the world there's examples like that um where people have lived that way but also where it's being encroached upon by nations and borders, by bad policies, by bad laws, by the future of that, uh, by lockdowns, by pandemics, where all of a sudden somebody, yeah, they're in a pastoral community and they gra graze their cattle, their goats, their sheep across many borders and many, many nations. Um, and then a, something happens like a pandemic or a catastrophe, climate change, and then we start to struggle over resources or ownership or rights and dividing ourselves up amongst one each other, one, one another for many reasons, protection, for fear, for, for, for other things. And those are really things that I hope we address uh, long-term. I live in Germany, I'm from America. I have family all over the world. I do business all over the world, just return from, from Asia and, and um, work with the united nations for crew members of our spaceship earth so for me it's really important to um, also break down those whether it's global citizenry or we find out somehow to get an inalienable human right as human beings as crew members of the spaceship earth for the future and um, i'm not going to throw all that on your shoulders that you're you're the one to, to fix that, um, but I I believe also through through blockchain and distributed ledger technology and DAOs and things like that that there are some ways to give us and and maybe also through the United Nations ID uh, ID system through through the United Nations to make us all some kind of a global citizen to make us all some kind of um, you know, member of this space, uh, this, this spaceship earth that a crew member, because it's it just right now, the world's not working for us all. It's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that governance really needs to be updated to, to the future. And so I don't know if you have anything to comment on that, but that's something that oh, yeah. I'm very passionate about. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Blockchain is so crucial, it's so important, it's such a disruptive technology we can use for good, but we shouldn't be naive. Because I know the idea of this of decentralized structure, of um, a decentralized system, 
um, using blockchain decentralized. Um, a ledger which is like, say, not owned by one entity, but by everyone who has access to this entity or copy of this um, program or the system on its computers, right? So this is a, let's say, from this point of view of a concept, again, if you think with a Bedouin's or indigenous people's head, it would be completely different, right? But going out of this gamification kind of world or want to fix or uh, change the current system kind of point of view, you can say, okay, this decentralized system using blockchain is a good alternative, okay? Why shouldn't we be naive? Because if we are not very, very aware from the very beginning, every kind of these tools like a digital ID given by one entity can cause the completely opposite of what we proclaiming we want to have, right? So it's crucial having a decentralized blockchain rather than a centralized. But again, if we, if we leave this and go back to the current moment and just do research on what is happening right now, governments are using, or many governments are using blockchain technology, but a private one, which means the information stored on this blockchain is belonging or controlled by one entity, which is far more dangerous than what we have right now. So I don't want to have a digital ID given by one entity. Why? Because everything will be done by this ID. If I buy a house, if I have a life insurance, it will be all done by this ID, which is fine. Again, this is a perfect solution for displaced people, you know, having just like remembering 12 numbers, right? And you have all your coins somewhere. Just remember this 12 numbers, whatever, wherever you are, you can log in, um, enter your wallet, and maybe your wallet will be an NF uh, in your wallet, your NFT, which is your digital ID, or even a soul bond token, which is like now developed or soon will be developed by Ethereum. Uh, a soul bound token, or let, let, let it be an NFT, it just stored on your wallet. So you need no paper, you need nothing, you can be displaced, you can lose your house and you have this 12 um, words. Should I explain what these 12 words are, Mark? You, you can, I think most people oh, okay. understand it's complex, but yeah, it's, okay. it's basically your token, your key. Yeah, you're like your your password to enter your wallet, right? So perfect, perfect, perfect. But think long-term, think of what else is possible with that. And if it does belong to one entity or government, what if I am not in alignment with the government? What if I steal something? What if I, I become rebellious, which is which I am always, always questioning the system, always. So I wouldn't get along with any digital ID for sure, but a centralized one, yeah? So let's, <laughs> I'm very much afraid of this concept. Um, it will be, it will be, I will be, I can be punished. We don't need, like I think, we don't need um, prisons in the future anymore because you can provide people from doing criminal activities with like their digital ID because they don't have access here or there or like um, censoring them wherever they um, get near something or whatever, okay? You don't need to put people in prison. You can exclude them from society because we will be able to pay everything with this ID. And I won't be able to pay everything, anything, not even bread, maybe. You know what I mean? I won't have a um, uh, uh, health insurance or whatever. Yeah. Everyone will know everything about me with my ID. So it can be this way. You know what I mean? It, it can be good for use for good. But again, if we're not fully aware of where it's going, look at just just look at China. It it can be it can go completely opposite to what this movement is 
seeking at the first place. Okay. I love that. I have <laughs> um, two last questions for you. And, Ooh, okay. And, and, and yeah. So um, if there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? And it's okay if it's maybe a couple part message, but uh, I would like to hear that. Okay. First of all, why not? Question everything. Like it's, I don't have clear advice. For me, it's just like the biggest advice or the best advice is to get people to a place where they rethink themselves and they enable them to think differently, like to change their mindsets. So first of all, why is around me the way it is and why not different? Question, question, hell question, everything in every minute and every single decision which is made by others or by you because everything has a reason and everything is just like a, um, Mm, an expression of things happened or the past okay so you can reprogram this by um perceiving the past in a different way and then um questioning the past or the present moment and then therefore taking completely different decision in the future so i'm not saying oh drive can I don't drive car, drive bicycle? No, you will know how to act and who to vote. Okay, for what to march if you start questioning everything. Okay, why is it the way we do the things we do, and why do we live the way we live, and how do other people live, and how do they survive hell with like one percent of what we have, right? And do they do survive? So do I need everything I do have? right now all this luxury i have around me okay i First. love it <laughs> second again a mindset thing our system is just a fiction oh, and this is not from me it's from harari right i say always law is a fiction so but the idea of governments national states corporates everything being a fiction i, I read it first in harari so um if it's a fiction, we can recreate it. And for me, this gives me, this empowers me a lot to, um, to know that law is just a fiction we agreed on. Because we agreed that these are the rules, then they exist and we implement them. Okay, and if I don't want to agree to those rules, okay, I, I get punished because I'm an outsider. But if enough people agree on different rules, then the law has changed, right? And again, this kind of law is also in our perception. Other people with other cultures, they don't have this concept. They have just like interaction rules with each others, which we would call law, but it isn't in, in another sense. Like, you know, as a comparative lawyer, I'm talking now very comparative legalish. Okay, these are my two cents. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? For me, I, I, I always say it's the journey. I love the journey. So um, I couldn't, I, I really couldn't say, say it before, um, except for I wish I would have realized it sooner and started sooner. But uh, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would love to know from the start? Mm, I would I would go in your direction because again, everything I learned and I the sideways I took just led me to connecting these dots and creating this this crazy and yet uh, important idea I created in this discipline and and what I'm working on in this institute. Um, so I wouldn't be that person if I just took the job in the ministry and have an amazing office and having a safe job and, you know, going nine to five to my, to my office. Um, I, I, I wouldn't be able to create this, right? So everything is valuable. But again, I wished I wouldn't, uh, I, would, um, I would know that it's so valuable what I have to offer to the world. And it is not just craziness, 
um like you know among the lawyers being creative is kind of a craziness <laughs> um but it's a very much needed uh mindset to be able to create change and that's why i should also have started much earlier and accept that it's an asset what i'm bringing and not not uh, like thinking out of the box questioning everything it doesn't make you um yeah it's just because you're different it doesn't mean you're worse or like less valuable the opposite is being one of hundreds my, my professor always told me you know what i 99 times i read the, the the same i'm happy you're the hundreds who are giving me something different to read because my my research were always different and from another angle so being the one out of hundred is a good thing yeah Dr. Abir Haddad, thank you so, so much for letting us all inside of your ideas. <laughs> thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. And it was a sheer pleasure. That's all the questions I have is if there's anything that you did not get to say or we left out, now is your chance. Otherwise, I really thank you. Oh, thank you. Um I'm happy um, I could share with you and it didn't felt really like an interview. You know, I enjoy very much our conversations and um, every way and every time. So thank you for having me. And I'm open to any questions or like get, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, just Google me and reach out via LinkedIn and I'm happy to answer any questions. That... We'll put your your links and, and your information in the show notes and um, ah, maybe everybody I'll... will be able to maybe... find you. These earrings are um, from a tree in um, uh, uh, Tanzania. So oh, wow. uh, made by a, a women project. So women use just parts of trees, parts of fruits, blah, blah, and create jewelry out of it. And I think it's so beautiful. I don't know why I'm saying this. It's just like, again, using... We don't need to have like using the resources we do have in a just a more sustainable way. For me, the earrings are the simple for that. That's why I wore them today. I remember we we uh, it was uh, this this is how how we'll end it. Uh, um, I was there in I believe it was February this year in Bonn, and we did yeah. a foresight workshop together for a few days and. Mm -hmm. And I was so fortunate to come over to your home afterwards and meet your family. And we all had some wonderful food together and enjoyed a, a wonderful time. Um, and and we partied. Yeah, we 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 partied in a in, in, in a in a very nice way. That's for sure. I met your wonderful children, your husband, your family. We had a nice meal together, and our friends, uh, Hindu was there, and mm -hmm. and uh, Stephen Ramage, and many other wonderful people who were at, at the Foresight Workshop for Resilient Frontiers. And I thank you for that. But the reason I'm saying this is because. You practice what you preach. You are the true soulful being that, that we see here on screen and that we've heard that you really care about humanity, but you're also very doing some very groundbreaking things on the future of governance, law, and policy in your own right. And I thank you for that. The world's much better to have you there. And I'm much better to have you as a friend and, and be able to party with you and have some good food together. <laughs> Thanks so much, Abir. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark.